The term populist has, for quite a while now, been one of the most charged terms in contemporary discourse. Journalists, academics, YouTubers and pundits have all had much to say about this term over the last few years. But more recently, an eerie phenomena is beginning to manifest and an ecumenical spirit is sweeping over some on the political left. Disenchanted and dejected over recent defeats in England and the United States, some are calling for an alliance between right-wing and left-wing populists. We hear some writers on the left praising GOP senators. Others argue that diversionary identity issues be set aside for greater electoral outreach. And we see a rather popular YouTube show on the rise that rests on the premises that a right-left populist alliance is indeed possible. I myself have a great love for inclusionary and non-sectarian agreements, but the dream of a left-right populist concordant rests on one, a faulty or a buzz fuzzy understanding of populism in general, and two, a lack of understanding when it comes to key differences between right-wing and left-wing populism in particular specifically when it comes to who the people are constructed to be in each form of populism. Theoretical foregrounding. What is populism? Historically, the term populism is Russian in origin, the translation of the Russian word Naranik, which derives from Narod, which is itself the Russian word for people. The movement grew from the soil of a Russian civilization confronted with the forces of modernity and industrialization and was theorized in order to help galvanize the population to fight for emancipation from a feudal and autocratic past. In the United States, a similar movement arose contemporaneously and independently called the Prairie Populist, a group of farmers who also, responding to industrialization, characterized farmers as the true people. Still, it was not until the middle part of the last century that the term began to receive systematic attention from academics. But since then, a rich and variegated literature has emerged that, while disagreeing on many taxonomic issues, has come to agreements on some of the fundamental aspects of the populist phenomena. Broadly speaking, the literature on populism can be divided into four broad categories. There are those who see populism, one, as strategy, two, as discourse, three, as ideology, for as institutional entity. In this essay, due to arguments from the literature that I roughly accept, I take it that populism is best explicated in ideological terms. Populism can be best understood as a thin ideology. An ideology can be defined as, quote, a system of shared beliefs that is relevant for social action, integration, and social stability, though it is not necessarily true, close quote. The populist ideology is thin insofar as it does not manifest itself fully on its own terms. It is dependent, parasitic, on a host ideology that is more comprehensive than itself. This point will be important later. The bare principles of the populist ideology are these. There are two homogenous groups in society engaged in a Manichaean struggle, the pure people and the corrupt elite. The populist argues that politics should be an expression of the general will of the people. Now it must be noted that the people and the elite are not predetermined terms in populism. The people is constructed based on the host ideology that populism feeds upon and the specifics of the socio-economic context of the nation in which it is present. These conditions determine the specific content of populism and help explain the difference between right-wing and left-wing populism, and these conditions are the ones I turn to now. Right and left-wing populism, preconditions and prescriptions. In general, populism can be understood as a response, and in some circumstances a reaction against liberal democracy. Democracy, too, is a much contested term, but here we take the term to mean the combination of popular sovereignty the idea that government is legitimized by the consent of the governed, majoritarian rule, and the method that allows for elective, peaceful, and continuous transitions of power between politicians. When the adjective liberal is used to modify the term democracy, 
we are no longer talking about just a system of popular sovereignty and the majoritarian rule, but the institutions and mechanisms that are put in place to safeguard principles such as free speech, freedom of, or firm religion, and the protection of minority classes. It is this institutional aspect that often sets populists at odds with liberal democratic regimes. Contemporary populists, sometimes classified as neo-populists, are products of how late-stage neoliberalism manifested itself in liberal democratic nations. In Europe, for example, the transferring of certain administrative slash government functions to unelected transnational bureaucracies like the IMF and European Central Bank, ECB, has removed power from the local populations and threatened the principle of popular sovereignty. This fact is grounded in the sharp economy that has now emerged between policy, the formulation of political proposals, which is now handled by the above transnational organizations, and politics, the discursive and performative exercise of gaining and exercising power, which would now be media focused. As one author puts the situation, the overwhelming power does not emanate from any parliament or from popular sovereignty, since the IMF does not belong to the EU. In the EU's current situation, the state of exception is not transitional. It constitutes its normal mode of functioning. The exception has become the rule and implies the complete submission of the political to the financial. Close quote. The processes that lead to populism then are based upon the growth of transnational institutions and the weakening of mediating institutions that tie the people to their representatives. That is, the civil institutions like unions, churches, and political parties have all lost a great deal of power and influence. This, some would argue, was by design, for the Hayekian program that neoliberalism advocated was based on the destruction of social structures in the name of preserving the free market and the insular nuclear family. Populists then use the principle of popular sovereignty to criticize the institutions that are meant to safeguard liberal values and circumvent the direct exercise of political power by the people. This is why populist politicians and activists make attacks on the media, the so-called political establishment, deep state, globalist, etc. Now, though it is true that the conditions that led to both left and right populism were similar. The reaction to these conditions were very different. In the United States, for example, the populism that has become a fixture in our political discourse can be traced back to the 2008 financial crisis. Two populist movements emerged from these conditions, the leftist Occupy Wall Street and the right-wing Tea Party. Both groups were angered at the treatment of the banks by the Obama administration. The Tea Party, in the name of fiscal discipline and personal responsibility, criticized Obama for the too big to fail principle, and Occupy, in the name of solidarity and justice, were critical that not enough help was given to homeowners during the housing crash and that the speculators that caused the crisis were not adequately punished. Both groups were critical of the handling of the financial crisis, but they had different points of emphasis different constituents, and this is the point that we will soon address, different ideological presuppositions. Populism, as we said earlier, is a thin ideology that needs a host ideology to feed upon, and the left and right wing populisms differ when it comes to the host ideology from which they draw their nourishment. The Boundaries of Peoplehood in the 2016 presidential race, then-candidate Donald Trump ran on his slogan, a broad one at that, that claimed that he would make America great again. Some commentators made the induction that this slogan implied that America was no longer great and that the slogan was a kind of code for the desire for a less racially and religiously diverse nation. Perhaps so, but the important point here is that Trump's slogan was an adroit example of constituent construction. By constituent construction, I mean the process by which discrete populations with diverse political interests are turned into a unified political group. The slogan united all those on the right who felt that the cultural, social, and political institutions were trending away from them without needing to be too specific about content. Nevertheless, the rhetoric that Trump used pertaining to Latin American immigrants 
the ostentatious pastiche of 1980s Americana that his campaign displayed, the ubiquity of the American flag at his rallies, and the cornerstone of his policy, the wall, made one thing clear. This was a nationalist campaign. Right-wing populism in America and elsewhere tends to feed off the host ideology of nationalism. As an intensive reader might expect by this point, the term nationalism, too, is a contested one. But, drawing from an introductory volume on the topic, we can say that ideological nationalism can be said to have the following characteristics. One, the world is separated into nations, each having a unique historical character. Two, the nation is the only source of political power. Three, national loyalty stands above all other forms of loyalty. Four, freedom is contingent on belonging to a nation. Five, all nations must have full autonomy and self-expression. Six, global peace requires a balanced world order of autonomous nations. Almost all of the above points can, at least in terms of rhetoric and symbolism, be found in the newly emergent right-wing populism, perhaps excluding the third point. Trump and his movement rail against the globalists, are supposed protectionists when it comes to free trade, are keenly aware of the connection of freedom to citizenship, hence the controversy over the undocumented in the census, and talked of a need of nations to stand on their own two feet, hence the anti-NATO rhetoric. The nationalism of the populace is not simply limited to the ideological, but stretches into the symbolic world where nationalists have always felt more at home. The central metaphor of naturalism around which all other metaphors revolve is the family. The nationalist in his spirit sees the nation as the family writ large and imagines the very colored geography of his country as a swollen, macroscopic image of his own home. The border then becomes analogized as the back door of the country and the legal emirates as burglars rushing the home under the cover of night. It is an unfortunate fact to continue the family metaphor, that all those who are within the home are not considered a part of the clan. Owing to its dependence on the historical understandings of a nation and the fact that this history often reflects a past that was less diverse, less equalized, and more traditional, the people in right-wing populism are constructed upon exclusionary grounds. This is not a value judgment, but a reflection of data and analysis, both here and throughout the world. For example, around 50% of Trump's base is composed of evangelical Christians, despite them making up only 26% of the population. Trump did not create his base. Extreme political sorting based upon racial, religious, and geographical lines did that for him. But what he did was constitute his people, based upon an exclusionary vision of America founded on an imagined past. The wall is the ultimate embodiment of this, for the wall is manifested separation. This exclusionary version of populism is not limited to the states, but can be seen in, for example, France as well. The identitarian turn was initiated with Nicolas Sarkozy, who tells us that, quote, when you become French, your ancestors are the Gauls, close quote. But the National Front, now National Rally, would pick up the mantle. Marine Le Pen and the party she leads are anti-immigration, both legal and illegal, and have led the charge against so-called radical Islam. They rail against the globalists, take up protectionism, and are nationalists just like their American siblings. All this is to say that the motive force, the animating principle behind the populist right is cultural and not economic. Le Pen has pulled back on leaving the EU but not immigration, and though Trump financed the wall, he still cut taxes for the affluent. Some populists on the left tie themselves in knots trying to emphasize that economics and race played a role in Trump's election as if the two explanations were somehow at parity. This is not to say that we should take the left liberal position that race qua race is what motivated Trump voters, or the success of the National Front in France, but instead take a third position and say that culture, which overlapped with race, was the main determinant. Trump voters saw undocumented immigrants as outside of the scope of the people because of their citizenship status and the connection in the mind of Trump supporters that they had to the globalist immigration agenda. 
The Latin American immigrant did not fall outside of the scope of the people qua mestizo, but as undocumented immigrant, and the animus towards black Americans need not be based on anti-black racism, but on the perception of black people as representing the democratic establishment. These cultural factors intertwined with and intensified already existing racial tensions, but I consider a cultural analysis to be the best explanatory method. Moving back to left populism, we must understand, first and foremost, that the left populist vision is inclusionary as opposed to the exclusionary right. We can see this, for example, in the Occupy Wall Street movement. The main point of Occupy was that the protesters represented the 99% in contradistinction to the elite. The elite was constituted in a financialized manner, and the discourse was focused on economic inequality. Anyone falling outside of the money of the elite, young or old, rich or poor, black or white, was, at least as far as the discourse is concerned, a part of the people. The economic point of departure of Occupy is not surprising, for left populism, here as elsewhere, is linked to the host ideology of socialism. Socialism can entail many things, but it essentially pushes for public ownership of the means of production, workplace democratization, and so forth. The program of left populism was started in Latin America as a response to the decline of classical Marxism as a live option for political resistance. There was still a need for organizing and mobilizing people from the left, but without the rigidity of laser-focused class analysis and with an openness towards the new identitarian resistance movements gaining traction. And to some degree, it was a natural fit, since many members of the liberatory movements also belong to groups historically marginalized economically. The left populist program has now become perhaps the leading left movement in the United States. The Bernie Sanders campaign, both in its 2016 and 2020 incarnations, has been the main force behind the movement. In both his campaigns, Sanders had employed the Manichaean language of populism to denounce the billionaire class, the Republican establishment, the Democratic establishment, and the mainstream media. He called himself a democratic socialist and constantly spoke about the multiracial, multi-generational, working class coalition. He has even proposed legislation for democratizing the workplace. The slogan of his campaign, Not Me Us, is a clear articulation of his expansive view of who the people are. The issue then is the clash between the expansive constitution of the people and left populism rooted in a socialistic background and the constrictive constitution of the people and right-wing populism grounded in nationalism. From this distinction emerges the distinction in what is emphasized. Right-wing populists, despite some left-leaning positions on things like free trade, are more focused on issues of culture and symbolic nationhood while left-wing populists, who constructs the people in a broader way, are more focused on economic issues such as redistributing wealth and empowering workers, though the discourse of liberation are also included, though not centered. The main issue of a right-left populist alliance, especially when it comes to institutional politics between lawmakers, is that there is an asymmetry in the relation that the left and the right have to the dominant neoliberal paradigm. The right populists, since their interests are mainly cultural in nature, are willing to make concessions to corporate power in a way that would be nonsensical for a left populist. As noted by Borriello and Jaeger when it comes to the European situation, quote, they, the right populist, are not anti-systemic at all, and thus might rapidly lose their aura of radical outsiders. Their main policy issues, anti-immigration, welfare chauvinism, anti-EU and security, require little but cosmetic fixes to European debt ceilings and occasional posturing on Western values. When it comes to migration, Angela Merkel and Matteo Slavini or Emmanuel Macron and Marine Le Pen have little to disagree on except how to distribute its financial load." Close quote. What is true of Europe is also true here. The right populist is the inverse image of the left liberal. Both claim economic heterodoxy but back down to neoliberal pressure. Both prefer the politics of symbolic forms over the politics of institutional overhaul. Both relish the class of culture narrative. The left liberal can be placated by representational posturing along identity axes, 
while the right populace gains the sucker from Muslim bands based on tales of Islamic extremists ready to storm the gates. So no matter how much Josh Hawley venerates Teddy Roosevelt, or how protectionist Marco Rubio has gotten on trade, or how much the current president postures about China and supply chains, the fact is that cutting taxes for corporations, including during the pandemic, is the main priority for the GOP. And in truth, a cross-national political analysis should not even be necessary to understand all this, but just the phenomenological capacity to see. Anyone who watched Trump's rise and rallies and the American iconography on full display could see that we were in the realm of nativist symbol and the political poetry of national restoration. No, it does not take sophisticated analysis to see that right populism is a cultural movement and not an economic one, but it does take leftist desperation not to see it. It is time for those on the left to stop pining for a chimerical unity that will not arrive and follow the great Tarsinian and put away childish things.